Hello and welcome back. Uh, we're going to watch part two of this video. So if you haven't seen part one, click on the link in the description, or if you are on Udemy, go ahead and click back up in the course. Uh, in part one, Stephen had his sections called the palace, the amphitheater, and the library. Um, and these were all about the extended mind. And so this was about how, um, how our mind expands beyond what's in our head. It also includes our surroundings. Let's go ahead and switch scenes here and put this in full screen and let's continue. I was transported to the Garden of Dilemmas. The dilemma before me was, when do I write outside of my brain and when do I write inside? Then I crossed those out and wrote, when do I change stuff outside of me? When do I change stuff inside? Then I crossed those out and wrote, when do I act? When do I learn? I kept writing new dilemmas well into the night. I wish I could tell you I resolved even one of them. But as my candle burned low, I finally wrote, when do I exhale? When do I inhale? Uh, exhale and inhale. This is something Stephen has mentioned before in a previous video. Um, and it was one where we talked about uh, the how versus the why and how um, asking the question why is a, lot, is a much better question when trying to learn something. The why relates to the inhale and the how relates to the exhale. So let's go ahead and see what else Stephen has. As I left the garden, I realized that even without looking at my paper, I could remember what I had written. It was not a crutch, but a tool for thinking thoughts that would never otherwise have occurred to me. And I also realized that no matter how much I trained my brain, no matter how strong I made that muscle, it would always still be stronger with external memory than without. It doesn't matter how good a computer is. Give it more memory and it can do more. In the um, so Stephen mentioned giving something more memory, it can do more. Uh, so in a computer, there's, there's a type of memory called RAM. And that's uh, whenever you turn on your computer, everything that's being displayed and running at the moment is in your, your RAM. And then uh, anything that's like uh, when you, you turn off your computer, the RAM clears and everything is in your storage or your hard disk drives or your solid state drives. So you can think of uh, maybe the uh, computer's RAM as your short term memory and the uh, hard drive and, and disk storage. You can think of that as long term memory if we want to use that analogy. Um, so, yeah. So like when you have much more memory, uh, you can um, you can do more. Right. So. 50s George Miller introduced the idea of the magic number seven plus or minus two. Basically, people can keep in working memory between five and nine things. I so, George Miller. So, let's go ahead and look him up. Open up a browser here. And I'm just going to type wiki George Miller. I'm probably going to find a lot of results. Let's go ahead and see the search here. Um, I'm pretty sure Stephen's not talking about any George Millers in entertainment or politics. Here we go, science. Now we're talking about uh, cognitive science, cognitive psychology. This episode is about the extended mind. And so I believe it is this George Miller that we're referring to, George A. Miller, American psychologist, one of the founders of cognitive psychology, um, or more broadly, cognitive science. Great. And so here he wrote a paper called The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. Uh, let's go ahead and click there. Uh, and like Stephen said, it's the idea that uh, the average human can hold in short-term memory um, 7 plus or minus 2 objects or things. Uh, great. Yeah. So that is our magical number 7 plus or minus 2 from George A. Miller. Let's go ahead and continue this video wonder why these episodes all have five parts. There are ways to transcend those limitations, both with external storage like paper, but also with a natural internal process called chunking. These are not unrelated. This episode had five parts. Chunks. Do you remember their names? Do you remember where they were located in the palace that I wrote down? If you remember all three rooms and their five parts, that's 15 things. Wow, that was fast. Your mind leapt over that nine thing maximum very quickly. Look, at the end of the day, computer science is a complicated palace. As you are moving through it, learn about the computer called your mind, not just the computers that your mind uses. If you do, things will get simpler and simpler rather than more and more complicated. 
All right. There's so there are some exercises below. Uh, when he says below, he's referring to in the description of his YouTube channel. Um, so he he mentions chunking, um, and I th I think I saw a link to that in uh, in this magical number seven article. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let's, let's see if it's in here. Chunking. All right. Um, I believe I saw a link to chunking. Let's just go there. In cognitive psychology, chunking is a process by which individual pieces of an information set are broken down and then grouped together. And we do this all the time with our mind, right? We break something down and group things here, or group those there so that, and this will help us remember more things, right? But with the video right now, this is part two. Part one is a chunk. Uh, that consisted of three of the sections Stephen mentioned, which was uh, palace, amphitheater, and library. And then this is part two, and the two sections in here were um, garden and denouement. So that's the idea of chunking. It's just um, grouping things together in relation to the way we store um, information in our memory. So uh, Stephen mentioned these exercises, so let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, at the description in his so here's the the video that we are watching and then here's the description um, there's some here's the title of the video if you want to do these other exercises we're only going to look at one of these here but all of these have to do with um, visualizing uh, information right or let's go ahead and take a look at number three um, project Euler problem number one write an algorithm to add up various kinds of numbers and then if you write a solution with any language of your choice illustrate how the algorithm behaves at runtime oh also i missed this question can you rephrase the problem as an illustration um, so this is not the full problem he, this is kind of summarized but let's go ahead and look up project euler so there's project euler.net and i already skipped to problem one here and here it is if we list all the natural numbers below 10 that are multiples of three or five we get three five six and nine and the sum of these multiples is 23. Um, so that's just the the setup um, gives us an example uh, now here's the actual problem find the sum of all the multiples of three or five below 1000. Uh, we're going to do a language inside a uh, browser this is called scheme or we scheme because it comes with uh, these drawing libraries um, i mostly code these days in racket which is based off scheme uh, and which is a Lisp type language. Uh, Lisp stands for list processor. And uh, it, we will need to draw something. So I'll go ahead and get my whiteboard ready here. Uh, there we go. And so the problem is, uh, let me go ahead and write it out here. Um, find the sum of multiples of three or five up to 1,000. Right, or actually, I think it says specifically below 1000, so we're not including 1000, we're going up to 999. I can sum up the question in a quick little diagram. Let's go ahead and draw a little box here. Um, so we have a box, and the idea is we have a bunch of numbers. Um, I meant to draw lines, and we want to go all the way up to 1,000. Sure, let's draw a box around that as well. And we want the multiples of three or five. So right, multiples of three or five. So this is, let's say this is the full set of numbers and we want the multiples of three or five, which are gonna be a smaller set of numbers um, and not necessarily next to each other. So. Let's go ahead and do that by drawing some boxes that look like this. And then we want to get the sum of that. So I can do, a, let's just do just little pluses. And I'll do a big question mark. So that's how I would phrase the problem. I can even draw like, um, these arrows. Oh wait, I have an arrow tool for that. A, a arrow. I don't know which numbers satisfy this, but the idea is that I will get a 
um, a sublist of the main list and the sublist I want to sum it up and then we want to get the result right so there's my diagram but let's actually code this out so we have a piece of data let's do the small data first so let's define and let's go ahead and make this bigger and I'll move my whiteboard aside for now uh, and I'll just write data and we have there's a function to get the range um, let's just do from 1 to 10 skipping by ones right if I run that I can type data and there I have 1 to 10 um, skipping by 1 1 to 10 and so if we were to get the ones that are multiples of 3 or 5 that means um, 3 and 5 are definitely multiples of 3 or 5 right well 6 is a multiple of 3 and then 9 is a multiple of 3 and then 10 is a multiple of 5 so some of these are not are going to get filtered out and some of these we're going to keep right so we need a way to um, programmatically get this sublist and just like I did with the thought process I, thought process in my head I want to be able to know if uh, a single value is a multiple or, of 3 or 5 so let's just do one of those at a time let's say let's define a new function and we'll call it uh, mult of 3 is it a multiple of 3 and then we're checking a number and so we want to be able to write multiple of three and put a number in and it should give us a true or false yes or no and in this language we have something called integer um, and we're going to divide uh, the number by three so if you divide that number by three and you don't get an integer an integer is a whole number right that could be negative or positive uh, if you divide a number by three like say one divided by three and that's not a whole number therefore it's not going to be an integer so then it would break this rule so this is something I can test and when let's go see what happens if I do 1 divided by 3 it says 0 0.3 what if I do 1 divided by uh, what about about 3 divided by 3 1 that looks like an integer so let's uh, let's type test that rule I'll do integer and I can copy what I just wrote in here, or I can copy the result. They both work. Um, let's copy the actual math, put it in there. So I just have a math operation uh, as my argument of this function, right? And it says true. Let me go ahead and change that. Uh, copy paste here. And let's try one. False, right? Because that is not an integer. So that works. So let's see if our function works. So we have mult of 3 just to make the syntax slightly easier and then you just pass in a number like 1. False. How about mult uh, of 3? Let's try a number, number like 9. True. Awesome. So this works um, but we have another problem. So let's go ahead and take a shortcut. Copy paste. That's okay. I wrote that code and pasting here. Uh, we want to check if it's a multiple of 5. So then I want to divide the number by 5 and check if that's an integer. And we can test that here. Malt of 5. And I'll just put 10. And then let's make sure we test the negative result. I'll do 9. Great. That works. So, but we want to have a nice way to check for both. And um, in this language, we have something called or. So I'm going to define another thing called malt of 3 or 5. That's just what I'm naming it. And I want to combine both of these two functions that I wrote here into one. And I want to combine them with an or statement. I want to say if it's a multiple of 3 or it's a multiple of 5, then it satisfies my rule. So here's an or statement. And my first thing is going to call mult, multiple of 3 num and then mult of 5 num. And I am iterating, I am checking each step of the way just to make sure my code works. So multiple of 3 or 5, well 6 is a multiple of 3, should return true. Um, 4 is not a multiple of 3 or 5, awesome. And what about 10? 10 is a multiple of 5, true. 
great, I have this function that will tell me if a single number is a multiple of three or five. Now what I need to do is take this large number as a refresher, uh, sorry, large set of numbers, and I need to whittle this down to a smaller set where it removes um, each one that is not a three or five, or we'll say it a different way, we want it to keep uh, each value that is a multiple of three or five. Now, in this language, we have a tool, a very powerful tool called filter. Um, looks like this, filter, uh, actually, let me go ahead and write it out here so you can see the exact result right away. So this is the, uh, the console or the interpreter window, so I can just run test code. Here's where I define code. Um, where I want it run it all at once. This is running one at a time on the right. Uh, so I will run filter and pass in a function. Now I'm not calling this function, I'm passing in this function mult of three or five. And what it means is it's gonna use that filter on each one of these values. So this third thing I pass in is a list and I already have a list called data. So for each one of these values, it will apply this filter that I made. I am only passing in the function, the procedure, and not calling it with a value. Because I can't call it on a single value. I want to call it on every single one of these values. So if I run this, it, uh, whoops, let me go ahead and I think I forgot to mult of three or five. So let me run that again, three, or five. There we go. And so there's my whittled down list three, five, six, nine, and 10. And if I wanted to sum those up, um, I can actually, uh, so the normal way to uh, add things together in this language, you can just, I can go three, five, uh, let me just do three, five, and six. That means I'll add three numbers together and get the sum. Now, I want to be able to do this to a thousand numbers, so I, I won't be able to just do that. So here's a, a list of 10. Um, so I can't just add this together. Oops. There we go. Um, because normally when you use plus, it's adding two individual numbers. Now, there's a nifty function we have called apply apply plus to this list of numbers. And what that will do is that will take every value in here and turn it into this, where it uses plus and then passes them all in, right? So I'm applying a function to this list, right? So there we go, and I have a value. Now, I wanna do that with code over here. So let's go ahead and define our filtered data. And we have filter malt of three or five that we tested. And that's gonna give us our filtered out data. And then we want to apply plus to the filtered data. So I saved it as a, a constant here so that I can easily call it here just so that it's easier to understand. Filtered data. And this should give me 33. Now 33, that's for a data set from one to 10. Uh, let's go back and look at, um, let's see, let's look over here. This says if we do uh, numbers below 10, our answer should be 23. Now I did including 10, so let's change this for nine and just hit run again. There we go, 23, I had the correct answer. Now the question was all the numbers below 1000, so I should write, 999 and hit run. And that is my answer to the question of uh, the sum of all the multiples of three or five below 1000. And that's my number. Um, so there's my coding activity. There's my diagram activity. So that'll be it for this video. If you are watching on Udemy, uh, go ahead and, and check out the assignments below. For everyone else, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can check out Steven's original video. There are some exercises there to try out, some research projects and some uh, note-taking projects. You can try looking up more Project Euler problems and see if you can solve them, and you can choose whatever language you want to use. So uh, that's it for now, and I will see everyone on the next video.